Great. So at the end of my first lecture, we had reached a stage where we understood the quantum mechanics of uh, some sort of free particle moving around an ADS. And we saw that it's just the same thing as an irreducible representation of the conformal group. This is actually familiar from one of the ways that we define particles in flat space as irreducible representations of Lorenz group. In ADS CFT, it's the same thing with the <coughs> symmetry group becoming the conformal group. So one last point that I didn't emphasize is that <coughs> when we talk about that, that conformal quantum mechanics, um, naively we might have been thinking in our heads about a particle, like an elementary particle, sitting in ADS, and of course it applies in that case. But our discussion was actually uh, implicitly much more general than that. Really, uh, our representation theory discussion applies to the center of mass degree of freedom of anything. So if we had some galaxy in uh, ADS, of course, its dynamics might be extremely complicated. But just in terms of its center of mass motion, uh, since everything followed from symmetry, uh, our discussion was perfectly adequate. And that's something useful to keep in mind uh, for sort of next lecture when we'll talk about aspects of locality in the light cone bootstrap. OK, so uh, <clears throat> at the end of last lecture, we said we can write down a quantum field corresponding to uh, a free quantum field theory in ADS just by <clears throat> promoting the single particle quantum mechanics to a Fox space of states with any number of these free particles and writing down the corresponding field. So that's very satisfying. If you're a bootstrap person, we didn't even have to write down a Lagrangian. We were able to get <coughs> all the physics without a Lagrangian at all. But of course, it's, it's a bit perverse to, uh, to, to take your philosophy to, to such an extreme. So I'll just begin by reminding you of uh, what you would actually do if you were starting with quantum field theory, and in particular, that you need to do canonical quantization. So if we have some free quantum field theory in ADS, we just have some standard free action. And we would apply the usual procedure from flat space quantum field theory to ADS. So what does that entail? Well, first of all, there's some equation of the motion, which we already both talked about and wrote down a solution for. So there's some grad squared plus m squared phi equals 0 equation of motion. <clears throat> and so we want to do some mode expansion in frequency space of this, uh, this equation of motion. We already did that. But then to study quantum mechanics, we need to define a canonical momentum and impose the statement that uh, the commutator of the canonical momentum with the field is a delta function. So this is pretty boring. <clears throat> so this is our canonical momentum. And we impose canonical commutation relations that pi of x, phi of y, minus delta in ADS. <clears throat> so I just want to briefly remind you why we do this. Why bother doing canonical quantization? Well, canonical quantization is really uh, directly associated with a particular inner product on our single particle wave functions. Um, that inner product is just four functions of space and time that satisfy this equation of motion. There's an inner product, and this would follow in any space time of i integral over a spatial slice. Of this expression, 
is an inner product. What's nice about this inner product is that it's preserved in time. So if we take this inner product at one time or another time, we get the same answer for solutions to the equation of motion. <clears throat> These can just be our free particle wave functions that we talked about last time. And this gives some normalization condition for those wave functions. So if this is normalized to be sort of uh, delta ij, where by ij I just mean sort of all of the indices on our discrete wave packets, then with that normalization, we'll automatically satisfy the canonical commutation relations. So if this, then we'll just be able to write phi t rho omega as a sum over all of the various quantum numbers. It's the Hermitian conjugate. And so this normalization is associated with canonical quantization. So the only reason why I want to remind you of this is, first of all, this is some natural normalization for the states in our theory, but also a slight subtlety is that this intrinsically depends on our choice of time. So if we were to choose different time coordinates, for example, here I'm thinking in terms of the global time coordinate, but you could use the Poincaré patch time coordinate. Those don't correspond to the same notions of time. They're different symmetry generators in the theory. One is the dilatation operator. The other one is P0, the translation operator in the little t direction in the Poincaré patch. Um, those are two different notions of time. They'll give us a different quantization, different wave functions, et cetera. We'll get, it turns out, the same correlation functions in the bulk, but we'll have some sort of different mode expansion. And this is just a nice thing to know. It sounds boring. It's a nice thing to know because this is how, for example, Hawking radiation was originally derived. Hawking radiation was really originally derived by expanding a free quantum field in the notion of time for incoming wave packets, and then re-expanding in the natural notion of time in the presence of a black hole, and using this inner product structure to, to realize that no particles incoming initially corresponded to Hawking radiation coming out. So just something that's, that's, that's nice to know. So in general, this is, this is what one would do. <clears throat> and so now we have our, uh, our quantum field. What does this inner product do? I'll just write it out for you. Um, so in ADS, it's just so. We just get an inner product on modes that says uh, is supposed to be some normalization factor times an integral d rho of uh, sine rho times 2 so the theta integral in ads3 is trivial because the spherical harmonics for a circle are just e to the i theta so i didn't bother writing that out um, and so this is what we get and it gives us some this you could do this integral um, it's sort of annoying. You get some nasty expression that says n n l squared is something like n factorial times some gamma functions that I'll uh, write out in general dimension. Hopefully there won't be any. But just so you know, this is what you would get for these states. So that's how we, uh, we quantize our field with this normalization for our wave functions, where our wave functions, and we'll actually need that formula, so I'll leave it out here, are general dimensions. <clears throat> 
then there's this hypergeometric function, which is really just a polynomial. OK, great. So these are our modes. So now we have a quantum field theory with any number of free particles. And it lives in ADS. It tra all of its states transform nicely under representations of the conformal group. And so we can ask, does this correspond to something like a conformal field theory? Um, in particular, uh, can we rewrite this quantum system as a statement about some local operators and an operator product expansion and all of the states that you get by acting with these local operators with an operator state correspondence uh, on the vacuum, et cetera. So <clears throat> one reason why you might hope that the answer is nice is that phi, our, our fundamental quantum field, <clears throat> creates one particle states, which transform as uh, under some single irreducible representation of the conformal group. So in other words, when phi uh, uh, Phi can act to create a primary state. It can act to create descendants. And so you might hope that phi is related to a primary operator in the CFT in some simple way. And if you're familiar with the ADS CFT correspondence at all, then you already know that the answer is yes. And we just need to send phi to the boundary, roughly speaking. Somehow, if we send phi to the boundary, then we can get a conformal operator. So then the next question is, is that well-defined? And is it unique? What do we mean by sending phi to the boundary? So we have our ADS cylinder. And for understanding uh, this correspondence, it's useful to think in the Euclidean case, then we don't get get confused about uh, notions of time. So we have ADS cylinder in, say, global coordinates. And we ask, how do we get to the boundary? Well, as we saw last time, this is uh, rho equals pi over 2. So as rho goes to pi over 2, cosine blows up. We, uh, we have an infinite amount of space near rho equals pi over 2. But uh, if we just strip off this conformal factor, then we get some nice leftover metric. And that's a space that we can live in. And what is that space? Well, if we take rho to pi over 2, so if we just naively send rho to pi over 2, we get a space that looks like it has a t direction and an omega direction. Uh, sine squared rho is just 1. And so we just get uh, r across sd minus 1. In other words, we just get a cylinder. Now, <clears throat> in contrast, we could try doing this in another coordinate system. There's another coordinate system where this would look equally easy. We could also use this Poincaré patch description and send little z to 0. Sending little z to 0 is very similar to sending rho to pi over 2. Then we would get r d. We'll just get a flat metric for the x coordinate. So this is, this is some subtlety. It's really a benefit, but it's something we have to deal with. What boundary are we actually going to live on? And why did we get a different answer in, this case, in these two cases? Well, the answer is that we have an infinite number of different choices for how to approach the boundary. We're going out to infinity, but we can go out to infinity at different rates in different directions. And that gives us a different boundary geometry. It turns out that we can get any geometry, <clears throat> any, any, any set of geometries that are related to each other by some overall vial rescaling. 
So we can just use our global coordinate system. It's perfectly good, <coughs> um, for example, to get this metric. So the general prescription is we want to say rho is pi over 2 minus epsilon times some function of the other coordinates f of uh, t and omega. We're free to do this, and then we'll send, uh, send epsilon to 0, approach the boundary, and f encodes the rate that we approach the boundary in different directions which tells us which metric we'll get. So just expanding, uh, this procedure gives us 1 over cos squared of rho of epsilon and f. And this just becomes 1 over epsilon squared uh, f squared <clears throat> and so we can approach the boundary by sending epsilon to zero and really just get any metric And what this means is that from our ADS description, we can obtain a CFT that naturally lives in all sorts of different spaces. So for example, from global coordinates, we can very easily get flat space. How do we do that? Well, if we pick rho equals pi over 2 minus epsilon e to the minus t, f being e to the minus t, then we get ds squared on the boundary is up to, a, up to an overall epsilon factor, e to the t. And now we can rewrite, uh, we can just say that r is e to the t, and so this is just dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. So a basic geometric point that I didn't emphasize uh, in the first lecture, but I probably should have, is that we have this boundary ADS cylinder. It's natural to sort of unroll a cylinder into flat space where we just have expanding concentric circles. So that the origin, uh, the origin of the boundary cylinder, uh, sorry, the origin of this flat space region is the infinite past in the cylinder. Infinity is the infinite future, and we just have all these expanding circles. So that's how we can get a flat space metric. But in fact, we can do all sorts of other exotic things, like. Maybe you're doing, uh, you're, you want to study conformal field theories during inflation. And so you want to study conformal field theories in de Sitter space. We can get de Sitter space very easily as well. Um, all we do is choose uh, rho is pi over 2 minus epsilon cosine of t. Now this, this It'll turn out doesn't make sense for the full range of t. But in some finite range of t, uh, it'll just give us 1 over cosine squared t dt squared plus d omega squared, which uh, if you're familiar with cosmology and in particular de Sitter space in uh, global de Sitter coordinates, then that's, that's the global de Sitter metric. So we can get all sorts of different metrics and CFTs on any of these various spaces if we approach the boundary in different ways. OK, so that's just the geometry. What about the physics? So the basic idea is that if we take our operator O to the boundary, we should get, sorry, we take our operator phi to the boundary, we should get something that acts like 
a conformal primary. So let's just show that that's true. So if we go to sort of some random point like here, so we take phi over to this point, that just corresponds to sort of having an operator O there. There's a very natural thing where we can go into the infinite past. Um, that would correspond to an operator sort of naturally at the origin of our coordinate system. So let's just, let's just try doing one of these, uh, one of these prescriptions. So uh, the statement is that O of t omega in whatever space we choose is equal to the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of phi of t rho of epsilon omega over epsilon to the delta. That's what we should do for our particular choice of rho of epsilon in order to get a conformal primary at t and omega in whatever coordinate system arises from our choice of f. So this is a definition. And this is, uh, this is an exact operator statement. So this isn't just some statement about uh, some specific correlation function, at least at the level at which we're working, where we have this free quantum field phi that we're taking to the boundary, or even an interacting phi. We can really, uh, we can really use this at an operator level. So what that means is that if we take our expansion of phi in A and A dagger creation and annihilation operators, then that gives us an equivalent expansion for O in terms of creation and annihilation operators. And that's the right thing. I mean, we have an operator O. Uh, as we'll see, it, it's, it's the answer that we would like to get. So in particular, that means that kind of all of the information in phi is preserved in giving us O and vice versa. I mean, if we if we're getting ahead of ourselves, but if we have O, we can sort of use some inner product on the modes as they, as they exist, as they live in, in coordinates t and omega. And we can get back by some inner product on O, any given A or A dagger. And we can use O to reconstruct phi, et cetera. So these, these are, at, at the level we're working, just equivalent things. Um, and in particular, um, we, we can use our, our wave function to just see what happens. So what happens here, we're going to send rho to pi over 2 minus epsilon, uh, say, e to the minus t, so that we can get a CFT in flat space, which is most familiar. Well, nothing happens to this and nothing happens to that. What happens to these functions? Well, sine uh, of pi over 2 is just 1. So this just becomes. Uh, 1 uh, up to uh, small corrections um, that are of order epsilon. This, <clears throat> this just becomes this hypergeometric function, which is really just a polynomial evaluated uh, at 1. And cosine to the delta rho goes to, goes to 0 at, an, at a rate that's of order epsilon to the delta. But then there's this. Extra, uh, extra piece that comes along for the ride of e to the minus delta t. And so that's, that's, that's what happens at, uh, uh, at zeroth order. And so all of this hypergeometric function stuff simplifies. It just turns into something. We have to evaluate this hypergeometric function at 1. It gives us some ratios of gamma functions. We combine those ratios of gamma functions with this complicated ratios of gamma functions in n. And we get some sum over these modes with just some new normalization factor. So we learn that O of t omega is just a sum over n uh, O nl, because it's, this normalization is different from the normalization we had before because of the hypergeometric function, times e to the minus 2 delta plus 2n plus l, uh, y j of omega. Plus e to the 2n plus l t, 
YLJ dagger of omega A and LJ dagger. So notice there's, I mean, this is almost the obvious thing you would have expected, but these exponents might not be what you expected. Um, there's some asymmetry between in the annihilation part and the creation part. That's not an accident. That's actually quite nice. <clears throat> that came from the fact that our cosine delta to the rho has an e to the minus delta t in it because of this factor. And what that, what that means is that if I evaluate O of 0, <clears throat> if I evaluate O of 0, then the annihilation part has this 2 delta in it. Uh, sorry. I don't want 0. I want uh, minus infinity, which corresponds to uh, r equals 0, where r is uh, e to the t. Um, in other words, I'm evaluating O at, this, at the origin uh, in flat space, then all of these factors go, the annihilation operators, when acting on the vacuum, just kill the vacuum. These creation operators will all give me zero because this factor uh, goes to zero, except for n equals zero, l equals zero. n equals zero, l equals zero, so this is basically just proportional to uh, a dagger zero, zero, acting on the vacuum with some normalization. And this is just our ground state of the quantum particle in ADS. That corresponds to a primary state in the CFT. So we see that as we would have liked, acting with O of 0 on the vacuum gives us a, a primary. So that's good. So more generally, we'd like to understand why O transforms like a conformal primary. <clears throat> and the philosophy is just that the transformation rules for phi, since phi defines O, should immediately tell us what the transformation rules are for O. And there is this subtlety that you have to keep in mind that rho depends on epsilon and on f. So in particular, rho, rho here, I mean, Rho depends on epsilon and whatever function we chose. So when symmetry transformations act on phi, they don't just act on t and omega in the completely obvious way, but they also act on rho because rho depends on t and omega uh, through f. So let's work out the dilatation transformation rule for O when we take it to the boundary. So. On the, uh, on the cylinder, uh, dilatations are just ddt on phi in our global coordinates. It's just the Hamiltonian, so that's all it is. But you'll recognize that just ddt as a partial derivative isn't the right transformation rule under dilatations for O. We'll see what, what the right answer is. It's not that. So let's just act the dilatation operator on phi and apply our formula. So the dilatation operator acting on O should be the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of the dilatation operator acting on phi, which is the full derivative with respect to t. But that has two components. So we'll get the partial derivative with respect to the sort of t slot of phi of t rho plus uh, d rho dt times uh, d d rho of uh, phi of t rho omega. So this other term is actually, is actually important. Um, what does it give us? Um, well. The, uh, <clears throat> naively, um, so we can differentiate either sines or, uh, or our cosine with respect to, uh, 
uh, with respect to rho, um, the term that will, uh, that will dominate um, because of our uh, d rho dt carrying uh, various epsilon factors is just the action on cosine to the delta rho. And so this will give us uh, d dt o from the first term plus the second term, which is proportional to d uh, cosine to the delta d rho, um, which just gives us a factor of delta times O. So in other words, uh, the final result is dt plus delta O. And this is equivalent to, uh, in, in normal flat space coordinates, this is just uh, rdr plus delta O, which is the usual transformation rule for a primary scalar operator. So the fact that we approach the boundary in different ways is actually important in order to get the right transformation rule for our operators. So let's do another example. I mean, it's a good exercise to check that all of the conformal symmetry transformations act correctly based on our definition of O. So a more complicated example is translations. Now, of course, in the Poincaré patch, translations would be trivial and it would be very easy. But because we've uh, decided to use global coordinates, translations aren't as obvious. And so uh, I wrote down the translation generator in ADS3. Last time, it has this p plus or minus form, which is e to the minus t plus or minus i theta. Uh, in ADS3, there's only one angle sine rho dt plus cos rho d rho plus or minus uh, i over sine rho d theta. So what do these various, uh, what do these various factors do? Well, sine rho just goes to, uh, sine rho just goes to one, and so we just get a ddt. This is, this is like just ddt. Um, you might have thought that this factor is trivial because cosine rho is going to 0. But we're also differentiating with respect to rho. And that brings down, uh, uh, that eliminates one of these factors of cosine rho. And so this, in fact, does contribute. And what we get is a cancellation between these two terms. Here we just had pure ddt acting on phi. But here we have this extra. Uh, explicit d rho, that cancels the, uh, the delta here. So we get something like uh, e to the minus t plus or minus i theta um, dt plus delta minus delta uh, on d rho. And then we get this plus or minus i d theta because sine rho just goes to uh, 1. So this is how it acts on O. So these cancel. So this is e to the minus t plus or minus i theta, dt plus or minus i d theta o. And this is just dz uh, or z bar of o if we write the boundary metric uh, as dz dz bar as is possible in 2D. So in, for 2D CFTs, an extremely common uh, convention is to write the metric in terms of a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinate, z and z bar. Um, these are given by uh, uh, dx plus i dy and dx minus i dy. So in other words, this complicated, ugly formula um, in the limit that we approach the boundary and acted on O in, uh, in the same way, <coughs> reduces to the simple thing that you would expect, just the translation generator in flat space. So <clears throat> if we went on, I mean, for example, 
rotations are very, very simple. Uh, DD theta doesn't do anything funny. So we could get the rotation generators. We could also obtain the uh, special conformal generators. They're somewhat like this, but a little bit trickier, just a little bit more complicated. Then we would prove that our O transforms like a conformal primary in a CFT. Now, usually, so the next thing that we can do is you can ask, what about the correlation functions of O? That would usually be the first thing you'd ask about. But here, we basically already know the correlation functions have to be correct because we have some quantum system where our operator O transforms like a primary. It can only have a two-point function consistent with conformal field theory. It's completely fixed up to an overall constant. And so we know our correlation functions of O have to be correct. Now, of course, there's a lot of other ways you can check that. They're more or less complicated. So, uh, race here. So, an exercise you can do, which is which is more painful than you expect, um, is to just compute the phi phi two point function in ADS using your explicit mode expansion, and then take phi to the boundary, you'll find that you get the correct answer. But doing that whole mode sum is actually a big pain. You can also just demand that phi, uh, the two-point function of phi in the ball has to obey the Klein-Gordon equation. That's somewhat simpler. Um, you'll find that it still has a complicated answer involving hypergeometric functions, but you can do it. Um, and then you can take both points to the boundary. There's an even simpler argument where you say, I want to compute the OO two-point function. Well, I can start with the O phi two-point function. If I take O to the boundary in this way, uh, and then I just still have phi in the bulk, then I have kind of simpler transformation rules for O as compared to phi. In particular, if you're familiar with the uh, null cone formalism for, uh, uh, for encoding conformal symmetry, basically the correlation function of O on the boundary with phi in the bulk is completely fixed by conformal invariance, just like the OO two-point function is. And so you could determine that and then, uh, then take phi to the boundary. So there are all sorts of ways of doing this. Um, the two-point function of O with itself is just up to some normalization. Or in conventional just flat coordinates, it's just this. So our O will have the correct two-point function. That's a very, very standard calculation. You can do it any of the ways that I mentioned. Now, more interesting question is, we now know that I have a primary O, but what other conformal operators exist in this system? In particular, is there an operator state correspondence? Is there an OPE, et cetera? And so uh, I'm just going to tell you basically that all of the arguments for both the OPE and the operator state correspondence that you might have heard about sort of from, from the usual bootstrap perspective have a simple ADS analog, which is probably more intuitive if you've never studied CFTs before than, uh, than the CFT argument. So the CFT argument is that uh, you take this picture and you say, I have some, uh, I have some state that lives on a particular circle. I have some state psi here. And I can use the dilatation operator to contract that state down, to evolve it down to a point. And then since the state is created just at that point, I, have, uh, I believe that there should be a local operator that acts at that point that creates that state. So what's the ADS analog of that? Well, since all of these. Uh, circles in the CFT correspond to circles like this in, uh, in, the, in the picture on the cylinder, I can fill these in with some Cauchy surface sigma in the bulk, and I can talk about some state psi that's living on this Cauchy surface in ADS. Now, just conventional time evolution from the point of view of global coordinates, I can push that state forward and backward in time. In particular, I can push it all the way back to the beginning of time. And that corresponds in our coordinate mapping to flat space to just being at this point. So it's the same, it's the same kind of idea. 
Um, what about the OPE? Well, the OPE is really also the same sort of picture. So once again, in the CFT, I have some circle, and I have some operator O of x and O of y. I imagine those act and create some state psi here, and then I map this back down to the origin. I can draw exactly the same pictures in, about concerning states in, uh, in ADS. If I have some operator O of x, some other operator O of y that act at some time, then it makes sense to, to imagine that generates some particular state that knows about those two operators and their positions. And then I can evolve that state back and, uh, and argue that there should be some nice operator product expansion as long as there's nothing going on inside, which means in this case, as long as there aren't any other operator insertions that happened before this time. So I start off in the vacuum, I act with these operators, and I get uh, uh, the state. And that gives me an operator product expansion. Of course, these arguments are rather formal, but uh, uh, they're no more or less formal in ADS. In ADS, it's just conventional time evolution that we're using. And you can make all of these statements extremely explicit by actually computing the operator product expansion of O. O here, just like in a free theory, has an explicit expansion in terms of A's and A daggers. So the OPE of O with itself is not a mysterious object. It's just what you get by multiplying. And so, for example, you'll get a contribution from the identity because uh, creation operator from one O can act on the annihilation operator from the other, and that gives you the singular identity contribution. Then you can ask, what else, what else exists? Well, there'll be terms that have two A daggers. Those terms with two A daggers are also not mysterious. They just create two particle states in ADS. So phi, if you act with phi on the vacuum many times in ADS, you produce many particles. Here, if you act with O many times in the vacuum, you create a state that corresponds to many particles in ADS. Um, so there's an operator state correspondence. What do all of the, all of the states just correspond to multi-particle non-interacting states in, uh, in ADS, not multi-particle states in ADS? <clears throat> that means that there aren't any anomalous dimensions in this theory. In other words, you can write, write all operators in the theory is just some number of derivatives acting on one O, some number of derivatives acting on another O, some number of derivatives acting on the nth O. And just evaluate this all at the origin. This just creates some particular n particle state with particular distributions of momenta in ADS. And these are all of the states in the theory. This is sort of all of the different possible combinations of creation operators acting in the vacuum uh, can be obtained in this way with various uh, indices for the O's. So we know the Hilbert space explicitly uh, and the OPE explicitly. And you can then use conformal representation theory to break these into primary states and descendants. The primary states, the primary multiparticle states, are just the states in ADS where the center of mass of all of the particles is sitting in this ground state wave function. So at the beginning, I said that uh, even complicated objects can be described in this way, in particular, complicated multiparticle states uh, uh, this applies to. OK. And so what about correlation functions of many O's? Well, they just follow from the correlation functions of many phi's. The correlation functions of many phi's uh, are only non-zero if, if there's an even number of phi's. The correlation functions of phi's just break into two-point functions. So the correlation functions of our O just take the form uh, O of x1 through O of x, say, 4. The four-point function just breaks up into weak contractions of uh, two-point functions. In other words, it just gives you uh, 1 over So 
If you know the terminology, if, if other people mention it, this is just the form of a generalized free theory uh, with a scalar operator of dimension delta. So that's what a free theory in ADS corresponds to. This is, in particular, this, this four-point function has a nice conformal block decomposition. Since our ADS theory is perfectly unitary, this has a nice conformal block decomposition that satisfies crossing, it satisfies conformal, it's conformally invariant, and it also satisfies all of the positivity properties that we would like. So in particular, all of the uh, conformal lock coefficients here are positive. And you can check that by just explicitly expanding it. We know the coefficients. The coefficients are sort of complicated, but you can just write them down. OK, so uh, <clears throat> let's move on now and talk about perturbation theory. So perturbation theory in bulk quantum field theory doesn't change anything about what we've said in terms of the dictionary or in terms of the symmetry transformation properties of O. <clears throat> and also at weak coupling, it doesn't change the fact that we get correlation functions that satisfy unitarity, not because all perturbations are totally innocuous. There are all sorts of different kinds of Perturb perturbative couplings you can add, but because there's a zeroth order term that corresponds to free propagation, this, this correlation function corresponds to basically a, something that you can think of in the Euclidean case as sort of particles propagating like that, or particles propagating like this, or particles propagating like that. So there's a free propagation piece that's perfectly unitary. And if we add a small correction to that with a small coefficient, for sufficiently small coefficients, it's not going to ruin uh, the positivity properties of the conformal block decomposition. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's straightforward, but uh, let's just write out an example. So if we have our favorite. Uh, toy quantum field theory. Say lambda phi to the fourth theory, then we can do perturbation theory in lambda using Feynman diagrams in ADS in exactly the same way that we would do perturbation theory in position space in flat space. The only difference is we have ADS propagators, and when we integrate our interaction vertices, we're integrating them over all of ADS instead of integrating them uh, over flat space. But that's, that's, that's the only difference. Um, in practice, this is kind of annoying. Um, the reason is just that the propagators and integrals are annoying. So I'll just tell you what the, what the propagator is uh, ADS. It's uh, e to the minus sigma y times a 2f1 of delta d over 2 delta plus 1 minus d over 2 e to the minus sigma over 2, where uh, sigma of xy is the geodesic distance between x and y. So this is some annoying propagator. You can write it down, but that's what it and that's what it is. And vertices are just just what you'd expect. So for example, we get some perturbative contribution to the phi four-point function, which is lambda possibly times some normalization factors times the integral over ADS of a propagator from uh, x1 to x, a propagator from x2 to x, a propagator from x3 to x, and a propagator from x4 to x. So that's what you do to get the four-point function of phi. Now, for each of these four phi's, you can just extrapolate them to the boundary using our definition, and you'll recover a conformal correlation function with all of the nice properties uh, that I described. So from the point of view of ADS-CFT, 
this formula that says phi is, uh, that O is phi over epsilon to the delta with epsilon goes to 0. This is sort of like, sort of like LSZ for ADS CFT. In flat space, we compute correlation functions of local operators, and then we apply the LSZ formula to get an S matrix. Here, we can compute correlation functions of local operators phi in the bulk and obtain CFT correlation functions, which are the boundary data uh, in ADS space. So these formulas simplify somewhat when we take the propagator to the boundary. The reason is symmetry. So uh, the bulk, bulk propagators have this annoying hypergeometric function form. But when I send one of these points to the boundary, say I send x to the boundary, this is e to the minus a number that's getting bigger and bigger. And uh, this is also e to the minus a number that gets bigger and bigger. So the 2f1 of 0 is just 1. And so we're just left with this overall factor. This needs to be renormalized. Uh, or in other words, we need to divide by epsilon to the delta. And once we do that, we get a simpler bulk boundary propagator. These things are just, uh, you can, in no co null cone language, they're just uh, of this form. So you might think, OK, well, at least the propagators now are a little bit simpler. It's still a huge pain to actually compute these things in position space. And the reason why computations in ADS are much more annoying practically than computations in flat space is just that uh, there's no equivalent of momentum space that's as good as the momentum space you're used to. In other words, there isn't a, a translation symmetry in ADS. Uh, there aren't d plus 1 different commuting translation operators, so we can't Fourier transform. And so uh, that very nice trick at the very beginning of quantum field theory that you learn of going to momentum space and now all the Feynman rules are just algebra doesn't really exist here. There is some analog of it. There's this thing called Mellon space that you may have heard of. Uh, uh, I've worked on it. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of good. But you still get, you can get algebraic Feynman rules, but they're still really complicated and horrible. And then you're in Mellon space. And if you want to get a position space correlator, you have to go back. So uh, uh, this is kind of a pain. On the first problem I gave you, there's an example of this where you can write down a closed form answer for the phi of the fourth interaction. And you can then do the, the somewhat interesting exercise of computing its conformal block decomposition and seeing what the consequences are for the spectrum and OPE coefficients of the theory. So in general, if I have some quantum field theory with a bunch of fields, phi 1 through phi n, and some interactions, I know at zero, when the couplings are 0, my Hilbert space is just free particles of each of these types. And adding interactions adds, in some, in some cases, adds new OPE coefficients. In other cases, it just modifies existing OPE coefficients from the free limit. And it changes the dimensions of multiparticle states. Changing the dimensions of multiparticle states means changing their energies, which means that there are some interactions. And uh, that's how the relationship between ADS perturbation theory and uh, this uh, uh, description of conformal correlators that we're used to in the bootstrap. So by studying whatever theory you want with whatever couplings you want, you get uh, many, many different solutions to the bootstrap. As long as you're studying a unitary theory in the bulk, you'll get unitary CFT correlation functions. So uh, any questions about ADS field theory? Um, so this prescription doesn't get corrected even in the presence of interactions. Um, you can ask why. Physical, there's a simple physical reason, which is just that you're taking phi infinitely far away from everything else. And so as you take phi infinitely far away, the interactions can't sort of follow it as it goes home. Um, and so from the point of view of this epsilon goes to zero limit, phi may as well be free because there isn't anything else nearby. So it's similar to the fact that the LSZ formal formula doesn't receive uh, quantum corrections. I mean, there's some LSZ formula for computing scattering amplitudes from field theory correlators. And uh, because it's some limit where you extract off some singular piece, just like here you're sort of extracting off some uh, most singular piece, uh, 
you, you, you don't have to sort of change the, the LSC prescription uh, in the presence of interactions. Good, good. So, so, what, so the question is, what do you mean by the correct operator? So as I take phi to the boundary, I will get some conformal primary. If I want to write phi, so there's an inverse question you can ask. Can I write phi explicitly as a sum of uh, parts of O? I mean, smeared versions of O or, or, or derivatives of O or whatever. So to leading order in some, in some free limit, phi is just given in terms of O. But once I add interactions phi, will have to also include uh, uh, multi-trace contributions. And you can work that out in perturbation theory. Um, but that's, that's more complicated. So the direction of going from phi to O is very simple. If you want to write phi in general and deep in the bulk in terms of O's, it might be complicated. And I don't think we even know a completely general rule for, for how to figure out what it is. Any other questions? Good, so that's something that I was going to comment on in, in just a second. So uh, first, let me tell you that we want to add gravity and why we want to add gravity. And then I'll answer your question. Um, and then if there's time, I'll do maybe one other thing. So so far, what, with the theories we've written down and explicitly discussed, what we get isn't actually officially a conformal field theory. It's something that has correlators that are nice and quantum mechanical and that satisfy unitarity. But it's not in any sense clear that we have a local conformal field theory. So what do we mean by locality? Well, uh, here I'm just going to say that locality is supposed to be the same thing as having a conserved traceless stress tensor. So having a T mu nu in the CFT that's a, in three or more dimensions, a primary operator. Um, so with conservation and tracelessness. So why do we want to have a T mu nu to say that our theory is local? Well, I mean, ultimately, this is a question of our definitions. But the idea is that. If we had a Lagrangian, and in particular a Lagrangian density for the CFT, then we would say that the theory is local by the usual rules just because there's sort of a Lagrangian density at x and at y. And you can imagine taking the Lagrangian density and putting it on some other surface, compactifying time with it, doing whatever you like. Um, there's some notion of sort of local stuff at a point in space. T mu nu, the existence of T mu nu sort of gives you that at a at a sort of more axiomatic bootstrap level without a Lagrangian, it says that there's some notion of local energy, energy and momentum density. So I mean, if we didn't have a T mu nu, but we still have all of the global charges, we'd be able to measure the total energy of a state. But we wouldn't be able to say that there's some amount of energy here and some amount of energy there. The existence of T mu nu, roughly speaking, allows us to do that. Um, it also means that there's sort of local space-time symmetries, if I have some hunk of stuff here very far from there, then I can sort of talk about moving it around without moving the entire universe. So uh, that's, that's the motivation for the definition. Ultimately, it's a definition. Um, once we demand that the CFT is local and has a stress energy tensor, then we're forced to include gravity in ADS. So why is that? Well, there are all kinds of reasons uh, why you can see that that is. But the basic idea is that T mu nu has a dimension equal to d, and it's conserved and traceless. That corresponds in the bulk to uh, having a some h mu nu in ADS that's massless. Now, you can you can ask this question sort of in terms of dimensions and relating delta to to mass. But a nicer way of saying it is that naively, if I have a if I have a symmetric tensor operator in the CFT, it has some number of degrees of freedom that, that you can count. But if I impose on that operator that it's conserved and traceless, that eliminates some degrees of freedom. Now, generically, a spin to massive particle has some number of polarization states. So for example, in four dimensions, 
a, a symmetric spin two particle would have five polarization states, so just spin two through minus two in angular momentum modes. But of course, a massless graviton in four dimensions has two polarization states. The reason why those, those, those states get eliminated is that for the massless spin two particle, there's a gauge symmetry, it's a gauge redundancy, it eliminates these extra polarization states. So in order for the counting of the number of states to agree between the two theories, we have to have some massless spin two particle. And that basically means that if it's going to be consistent, we have to have, uh, have, to have gravity in ADS. Um, now, there are a lot of very, very nice things about the relationship between conserved currents in the CFT and gauge fields in the bulk. Gravity maybe being the most special gauge field, but uh, you can also talk about spin one gauge fields. Um, in particular, the nice universal properties of uh, gravity and gauge theory, like the fact that gauge bosons have to couple to charge, uh, the fact that gravity gravitons have to couple to energy and momentum in a universal way. They can't sort of ignore some species of particles and only talk to others. Um, the, the connection of that with the CFT is that the stress energy tensor of the CFT has a lot of universal properties. In particular, it has ward identities that guarantee that it has certain couplings to every operator. Um, and uh, it has, uh, it has, it, it has other. It, it has a central charge um, that, that tells you about its normalization, uh, et cetera. So, the, so basically, this the universal properties, universal features of T mu nu relate to the universal features of the graviton. And uh, in the next lecture, we'll see this very explicitly. We'll see that using the bootstrap you can actually derive universal long-range gravitational forces just as a consequence of the existence of the stress energy tensor. So that's kind of nice. Um, the inclusion of gravity is also necessary for locality in another sense, which is sort of the answer to your question. We'd like to get the right partition function for our theory. I mean, just in a very gross way, we'd like to sort of count states and get the right number of states. Um, if we really had a theory in d plus one dimensions, it seems like we'd have the wrong number of states at high temperature as compared to a CFT in d dimensions. Well, that's where uh, uh, black holes come in. So in ADS CFT, a thermal state of the conformal field theory is a black hole in ADS with that temperature. So if you, if you put the CFT, uh, uh, if you compactify time and put the CFT at finite temperature, at extremely low temperature, you might have no black holes. Um, but at very, very high temperature, you'd expect that the theory is going to be described by some large ADS Schwarzschild black hole solution. Now, uh, this, is, this is in the case where there is some nice ADS description of the CFT. Um, if you have some CFT like the 3D icing model, then you don't have a nice ADS description. It's sort of hard to say what you mean by there being a black hole. But in cases where uh, gravity is weakly coupled and there aren't a huge, huge number of uh, states at low dimension or low energy in the CF in, in ADS, um, that's what you expect. So there's some Hawking page phase transition between the sort of low, low temperature phase without black holes and the high temperature phase with black holes. Um, that's something that's been well studied. And in uh, some of his lectures, I think Tom Hartman will, uh, will talk about this, especially in the case where we understand it very well in 2D CFTs and, and ADS-3. Um, Good. So one other comment about what I just said. Um, so what about uh, the Planck scale? So if we have a theory of gravity, there is this dimensionful coupling, G Newton, which maps to uh, 1 over an energy scale, the Planck scale, to the d minus 1. I mean, there might be factors of pi, depending on your favorite definition of M Planck. So what does this correspond to? Well, in flat space, the Planck scale is just some scale. It's hard to compare it to anything else. In ADS, of course, we have an ADS curvature length. So we can compare the Planck scale to the ADS length. Now, if the Planck scale is of order the ADS length, then quantum gravity matters a lot. Gravity is very strongly coupled, even at relatively long distances. And there's no sort of good uh, perturbative description. 
So in other words, we want G Newton to be small uh, in ADS units, which means that M Planck is big in ADS units. And this, of course, has a natural translation in terms of the CFT. We want, uh, so M Planck, R ADS, if we just have pure ADS to the D minus 1, this is related to the central charge uh, in the CFT. In 2D CFTs, it's the only central charge. In uh, higher dimensional CFTs, it's some coefficient CT in the normalization of T mu nu. So you can compute, uh, you can study graviton propagation or graviton exchange and extract G Newton. Um, similarly, you can look at how the, the normalization of the stress tensor or it's compared to its couplings to other operators, which are fixed by the word identity. And there's some um, universal number CT. And so you want this to be big. Uh, when, when perturbative uh, ADS CFT makes sense. So this is an extremely important uh, idea. Roughly speaking, CT sort of counts the number of degrees of freedom in the CFT. It doesn't exactly. Uh, it does exactly in, in some sense in two dimensions. Uh, in higher dimensions, it, it might not. Um, but uh, roughly speaking, the idea is that you need a conformal field theory with a lot of degrees of freedom, because adding more degrees of freedom adds to CT. Um, and of course, in all of the famous examples, uh, CT is related to some large n parameter for a, a gauge theory or the ON model or, or what have you. So, <clears throat> That's what happens when you include gravity. You have to make the Planck scale large or CT big. Then gravity is perturbative in some large, for some large range of scales. Then you can do perturbation theory and study classical solutions. Black holes correspond to heating up the conformal field theory. Um, perturbative graviton exchange corresponds to things like the exchange of the stress tensor conformal block and the bootstrap. Um, so, uh, so that's the story. So, Maybe to finish up uh, this discussion, I'll just mention one other thing that I skipped due to time. So um, there's a nice correspondence between ADS physics and uh, the null cone description of the space where the CFT lives, and in particular, conformal correlators. So I'll just mention that. So, um, we wrote in global coordinates x naught uh, as uh, cosh tau over cos rho x d plus 1 and xi as uh, tan rho mega i for some direction omega. So we can ask what happens when we approach the boundary from the point of view of these x coordinates. What was nice about these capital X coordinates is that they encode the symmetries in an extremely transparent way. So as we approach the boundary, we get uh, <clears throat> rho is pi over 2 minus epsilon f for some function of t and omega. Um, and that means that uh, cosine rho is as it appears in all of these factors, is going to 0. So all of these x's are going to infinity. So in particular, we can define some p as epsilon x, and then send epsilon to 0. And these p's become uh, perfectly nice variables that we can use to describe our conformal field theory living on the boundary of ADS. In particular, note that uh, x satisfied the constraint xa, xa is equal to 1. So p's therefore satisfy equals 0. Now, the x's encode, because, x's satisfying the constraint I just wrote encode d plus one dimensional ADS space, but we are approaching the boundary sending epsilon to zero, so we better not have d plus one independent coordinates. And 
The reason why we don't is that we also identify p with lambda p. These are identified with each other. Because the difference between p and lambda p is just some overall factor of epsilon, and we're sending epsilon to 0. We can send epsilon to 0, or 2 epsilon to 0, or whatever we like. So there is this identif additional identification, which uh, brings us down to d coordinates in the p's. Um, now, notice that from the point of view of ADS-CFT, this rescaling of the p's has some simple interpretation. It's just the fact that our metric, so this corresponds to ds squared, the metric for the CFT, goes to uh, lambda squared. So if we encode kinematics using p's instead of t and omega on the boundary, then uh, when we rescale the p's by lambda, we're effectively performing some sort of uniform stretching of the space that the CFT lives in, which means that, in other words, we're performing something like a dilatation. And therefore, we should, uh, at least in, in, in the case of flat space, and so there should be some nice symmetry properties, some nice scaling property when we write operators in terms of p. So uh, this formula is handy. <clears throat> so if I have some O of p, then under p goes to lambda p, I expect O goes to p lambda to the minus delta. So I have this constraint on correlation functions of O's. I also know that, say, if I have a two-point function, so I have O of p1, uh, O of p2, then it's extremely easy to write down conformal invariance, right? The only conformal invariance that I can make out of two p's is p a dot is p one dot p two, um, because I, I have, I mean, conformal invariance is just Lorentz invariance in this d plus two dimensional space that these p's parameterize, and so that's how I can uniquely fix the two point function in the CFT without doing any work at all. If I write it in terms of p's, it could only depend on p one dot p two. Um, and it has to have this scaling property, which uniquely fixes this function up to some overall factor. And so this is a great language to use to describe all kinds of correlation functions, um, especially in the case of spin, especially multi-operator multi correlation functions. So uh, uh, it's, it's a very nice thing to know. The choice of f chooses a section of this null cone. So remember that we can choose different f's, whatever we like, when we approach the boundary uh, that the, where the CFT is going to live. If we choose different boundaries, we're choosing a different section of this null cone. So the null cone is, uh, I mean, it's a cone because in our hyperbolic metric, this is, uh, this is like p0 squared minus the sum of uh, pi, if we're in the Euclidean case, squared is uh, 0. So this is a cone, it's a hyperboloid de degenerating into a cone. Um, and we can choose a section of it. Uh, in this way, and different sections give us the CFT in different uh, conformally flat uh, manifolds. So uh, that's it for the P's. Any questions about uh, anything about ADS CFT in the bootstrap? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so far, everything that we've said has to do with global conformal symmetry. But in 2D CFTs, we have this much, much larger symmetry of uh, Vera Soro. Um, it has a very beautiful interpretation. So long before ADS-CFT was discovered, Brown and Hinault showed that if you study the asymptotic symmetry of ADS-3, they're not just the conformal group, but they're actually the full, uh, sorry, the global conformal group, but they're actually the full Vera Soro symmetry group. So that includes not just isometries of the space. Of course, the isometries of ADS-3 are just the isometries we've been writing down, but also in the presence of gravity, diffeomorphisms that vanish sufficiently quickly, but also sufficiently slowly uh, as you approach the boundary. Now, 
those Virasoro transformations, since they're not isometries, they don't preserve the vacuum. If I start out in the, in the, purely in the vacuum, um, I don't, when I act with them, I don't stay in the vacuum. <coughs> that means that all these Virasoro generators, uh, when they act in the vacuum, build up non-trivial gravitational fields. Um, so, uh, in other words, uh, an, an, another related statement is that the stress energy tensor in the CFT is related to the gravitational field. In 2D CFTs, the stress energy tensor is, uh, it has a mode expansion, which is just the Virasoro, the Virasoro generators. So all of the correlators of the stress energy tensor, not just its correlator with say, not just its three point function, but all correlators are completely fixed by symmetry. That means that sort of in a certain sense, all of the matrix elements of gravitons in ADS3 are determined by symmetry. Um, and so you can, you can go a long way uh, with that. And I think Tom is going to mostly be talking about ADS3 CFT2. And so he'll, uh, he'll explain all of these things. Any other questions? OK, well, stop there and. <clears throat>